after a day in which we were immersed in beauty, we have come to our final session. We are honored and delighted to have as our keynote speaker, Daniel Libeskind, an international figure in architecture and urban design, renowned for his ability to evoke cultural memory and informed by deep commitment to music, philosophy, and literature. We are happy, very happy, to welcome Nina and you. Daniel Lipskin was born in Poland, immigrated to the United States as a teenager. He lived for a while in a kibbutz here, Gvat, and after studying music in New York and Israel on an American Israel Cultural Foundation scholarship, he developed into a musical virtuoso before eventually leaving music to study architecture. He received his professional degree in archite architecture from Cooper Union in 1970 and a postgraduate degree in the history and theory of architecture from the School of Comparative Studies at Essex University. Daniel Libeskin established his architectural studio in Berlin in 1989 after winning the competition to build the Jewish Museum in Berlin. In 2003, Studio Libeskind moved its headquarters to New York City when Daniel Libeskind was elected as the master planner for the World Trade Center redevelopment. Daniel Libeskind's practice is involved in designing and realizing a diverse array of urban, cultural, and commercial projects internationally. The studio has completed buildings that range from museums and concert halls to convention centers, university buildings, hotels, shopping centers, and residential towers. Daniel Libeskind speaks widely on the art of architecture in universities and professional summits, also at academies. His architecture and ideas have been the subject of many articles and exhibitions influencing the field of architecture and the development of cities and culture. His new book, Edge of Order, detailing his creative process was published in 2018. The beauty of architecture can be eternal and can be carried from time immemorial to future generations. I mentioned that Daniel Libeskind is informed by a deep commitment to music, philosophy, and literature. No wonder that the title of his lecture, Thy Eternal Summer Shall Not Fade, was given by William Shakespeare, Sonnet 18, describing the beauty of the beloved and aiming to carry it down to future generations. So, with great interest, gratitude, and curiosity, we'll be delighted to hear you. Please. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, you know, this sonnet, Thy eternal summer shall not fade, ends with the following uh, thought. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and so on and so on. So I think uh, Shakespeare had uh, shared, I share his idea, that, that unlike Marcel Duchamp, who said that a work of art will die in 30 years and will be completely dead, because the people are dead, the ideas are dead, and nothing can be said about it, uh, I really don't agree with it. Neither do I agree with uh, you know, the art uh, of the Arte Povera movement, who, which postulated an artist's shit can actually be an art. And he produced, Manzoni produced a can called Artist Shit, 
and it is in the museums around the world. So I do believe, and I'm not old fashioned, that the freshness of art stays, no matter how broken the art can be in time because of the residue of, of, of transformations. So let me share with you uh, here, I would be remiss if I didn't, ah uh, yes, uh, I have these three uh, uh, quotes which I think might be interesting. Heraclitus, ancient, you know, pre-Socratic, hidden harmony is stronger than the visible. It's, it's a kind of an amazing thought that, that a hidden beauty, hidden sense is not obvious, cannot be obviously applied. Otherwise, everything could be beautiful. If beauty could be, uh, you know, made a function of thought, there could be a law of beauty. Everybody could produce beautiful, but we know from the experience as you drive from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem that it's hard to produce beauty. <laughs> when building a Vitruvius, a Roman, you know, this is the Roman Empire, Augustus, uh, when building account should be taken of strength, utility, and beauty. That's probably the most read text in the history of architecture. Vitruvius, you know, Alberti copied it and many others, but it's very simple, strength, utility, beauty. It doesn't really go into uh, too much about beauty, except in his studies of proportions. And then Rambeau, that great French poet, beauty, that's, you know, 1890 or something, something, beauty will be convulsive or not at all. So the beauty, the convulsion, uh, which is a kind of illness or expression of pathos is, oh, so we can see that the history of beauty is long and no one can claim to stand for beauty in our era. But I have to be, I would be remiss if I didn't start with my building, first building uh, in Israel uh, at the uh, Bar Ilan University, a university that is really, if, I think, a great institution uh, and uh, a building that is my first contribution to Israel uh, in education. It's a building that is both for the university and for the neighbors. It's, it's really exchange point. Uh, it uh, has you know, large uh, flexible spaces, a large auditorium for about a thousand people. Many more thousands can use the building. And it's a building that speaks to the larger uh, sense of this campus and the beauty really of Israel. Okay, a new language. You know, where did I come from? And I have to say that this will be personal because it's about my process, creative process, how I see beauty. A new language. You know, for many years, I was not an architect. I mean, I was trained as an architect, but I didn't practice architecture. Actually, the Jewish Museum Berlin was my very first building. I never even built a small building before then. And uh, what did I do? People ask me, you know, before. What, what did I do to qualify me to be an architect? But the truth is that I drew. And I, I always believed that architecture comes from a drawing. This is an ancient thought. It doesn't come from going onto the site and measuring you know, beams or learning the craft on the site. It comes from this amazing idea of what a drawing is. And of course, since I did not have you know, a client, I didn't have a budget, I didn't have a social framework, what could I draw? I did not want to draw fantasy castles. But I drew a kind of the structure of architecture which has to do with proportions, with a sense of space that is imminent in the search for what is beautiful. And later on, you heard that I was a musician uh, in my first part of my life. I created another, you know, these are large series of drawings uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which are lengthy, but I will just show some examples. These are, these are called chamber works, so I related uh, musical space, musical experience to architectural space. They are, again, not fantasy buildings, but they're kind of plans of possible information that can be gathered in terms of structure of architecture. And these kind of horizons, paint uh, drawings, uh, really are kind of my treatise of architecture. If you read, look at Palladio's work, you know, the great Palladio, not a single one of his buildings in that treatise was actually built the way it is drawn. But that was his ideal sense of proportion, space, materiality, light. So those were mine. And later on, just more recently, at the Venice Pavilion, I created uh, what I call sonnets uh, uh, from Babylon, which was, again, a, a, a new set of drawings, a new set of ideas about architecture, space, and how it sort of goes together. Now, what about geometry and beauty? I call this 
the round corner table. And you'll wonder why I'm calling, showing you this Formica table. But you know, I grew up as an immigrant in the Bronx. We lived in a very small apartment, two rooms, with my sister and my parents. And my parents had bought a very ungainly Formica table. You know, I didn't have a draw, drafting board for my, when I was a student. Uh, the problem was that, you know, after dinner, you know, I have to clean the table, you know, clean the, you know, wash the dishes, put the drawings on this table. And you know what a T-square is, right? T-square is that, that thing that guarantees that you can produce a right angle while you slide it. But this table had large round corners. <laughs> and so you know that it's difficult to know exactly at what point you're already on the curve, maybe one degree. And, you know, since I had Bauhaus teachers, which re who required very strict uh, discipline of the right angle, I realized that, you know, there was something in this turn that produced the 359 other angles. Now, the poem, the uh, angle droit by Le Corbusier, poem to the right angle, I recommend you read it. It's really Re Le Corbusier, the great Corbusier, treatise on what is reality. In it, he actually says that if anyone ever departed from the right angle, we would be in the apocalypse. <laughs> right, we're not in the apocalypse. I've created many buildings that really do not do that. For example, the Royal Ontario Museum, which is a juxtaposition of old architecture, old, well-known buildings, and the new sense of an emerging new. And of course, it's not really whimsical because the architecture has to deal with program, has to deal with requirements of space, what the museum wants. One thing for sure that this museum didn't want, as most other museums don't want, don't give us another box, Mr. Liebeskin, please. That's why I invite you. So again, creating a building that has the strength, spatially, to create public space, to create large-scale urban vitrines for the largest collection of dinosaurs, for example, in the world, which is in Toronto, and to create a sense of something that mediates between the old building, as you can see, and the new crystals is really the phantasmagoria of possibility of creating the wonders. And let's not forget that museums were created, created to show wonders of nature, wonders of art. The idea that you could put everything into a box and create a sort of instant idea of nostalgia and history is really not realistic because buildings have to live and they have to support that wonder, whether it's a dinosaur or a Chinese porcelain uh, vase, that's really part of the remit of this museum. And of course, it's a museum that was very controversial, radical, you know, uh, but it has attracted millions of people and cities grow, geometries change, spatiality changes, but the idea of beauty, the idea of what stays, what isn't fading away, what isn't aging is part of it. Now. Shifting stones, that's also beauty and memory. And I uh, here a sort, of, uh, sort of refer to my fav one of my favorite books about architecture, which is Marcel Proust's Great Oeuvre, you know, in English translated as Remembrance of Things Past. If you read that book, well, if you didn't, I highly you know, recommend you do. It's many volumes on what is, what is really life about. And I just finished reading an essay by William James the brother of Henry James, the great professor at Harvard of psychology, who wrote an essay, Is Life Worth Living? 1903. It's a fantastic essay. Read it. Is life worth living? It's not an obvious thing. It, one has to analyze. So what does Proust say here? Proust says that he was visiting, he was very wealthy, visiting, you know, one more time, uh, the uh, San Marco, uh, the Basilica of St. Mark's in Venice, and he suddenly stood on two he felt uneven stones. You know, the ground is not very even in, in San Marco. And that visceral moment of revelation brought him back to the two uneven stones, or a couple of uneven stones, in his village of Ilie, Combray, in the book, uh, where he remembered his grandmother, you know, when he was a young kid. And that moment of collision or collapse between San Marcos and his childhood gave him the revelation that he should write a book about time and the fact that time is not lost, but that time can be regained. That time is a mystical entity that is not chronological at all. So yes, that sense of memory is part of my idea when I built the Felix Nussbaum Museum. 
You might not know the self-portrait of Felix Nussbaum. He was a German painter, a Jewish painter, uh, who painted this haunted portrait. Uh, he was a German. He painted romantic paintings. And then in 1933, his life changed. He, his scholarship in Rome, Peter Rome, was taken away. He was hounded uh, by the uh, authorities, by the Gestapo. He escaped to many holding camps and wound up finally in Brussels painting with his wife, Falka Platek, also a Polish Jewish painter. Uh, unfortunately, his neighbors in Brussels, you know, the turpentine smell, he's painted in oils, gave him away and he was deported, unfortunately, on the last train to Auschwitz where he perished together with his wife. Uh, but this portrait tells you everything. You don't need to know more about that haunted look. And how do you base a painting on that look? Now, it's a museum. It's a small museum in a town which is close to the Dutch border in Germany. You can see here the old historical museum, the famous villa there, uh, also a cultural building. And behind it is a kind of broken building into three parts. The long one, which is the paintings before 1933, the break, the empty sort of concrete, I call it the Nussbaum walk, the Nussbaum guy, and that bridge that connects back to the building. And, and a new addition that I did. So it's a very blank, uh, unpaintable panorama of, of his life. And here in the, in the museum, uh, which is the wooden clad museum, you can actually see, I don't know if you can see there, his painting uh, of uh, his bar mitzvah at Roland Strasse synagogue, which stood right next to where this building is built. So it's really a kind of a time machine, this building, with its breaks. Now, the Nussbaum Gang, the Nussbaum Walk, is really the narrowest place I could design in Germany under regulations. I wanted to design the narrowest possible place, which is a meter 80, 90, 90. It's two wheelchairs being able to pass each other. And I wanted to, to sort of have public not just look at his paintings, you know, aesthetically as beautiful paintings, which they are, like the Dance of Death paintings about the Holocaust, but sort of his position in this attic, which had no space, where he was so close to what he was drawing. It's a very haunted space. It's a very unusual space to look at paintings. And of course, you've got the three sort of uh, fragments that you saw from the aerial view, the wooden building, the, you know, the romantic paintings of Nussbaum. Then you have that concrete break, which is a long, long, narrow, narrow building. Uh, and then you have the bridge, uh, the metal bridge that connects it back to the historical museum. And by the way, when I designed the bridge, people said to me, why are you designing a bridge? I, I call it the future of Nussbaum. They said, there is no future for Nussbaum. We know all his paintings. We know where else his paintings are. There is no more we are ever going to know. But as a result of building the building, and that's really kind of mystical, two collections of Nussbaum came back to Osnabrück from New York and from Tel Aviv, where his name had been erased from the paintings in 1933, whatever. They came back. So there is, you know, as Nussbaum said, there is the, the, the wooden building, the metal bridge, and in the middle is that concrete narrow walkway. By the way, Nussbaum in his letters said, if anybody ever finds my paintings, treat them like a bottle into which a message has been placed into the ocean of history. If you find it, read it, it might give you a sense of what to do. It was a visionary and an amazing human being as well, and great painter. And then I was able to even build this addition. When, when I built it, there was no need for a cafe or bookstore. You know, it was a very, very limited building. But you know, numbers increased. Osnabrück is a little bit like Salzburg uh, in Austria. It's, it's a very, you know, it has been bombed, but the center is famous where Bach had his first appointment. It's where the Treaty of Westphalia was signed. So this broken like facade standing next to this building, which by the way has, is, Osnabrück is where the oldest German remnants have been found. That's, that's where Hitler said the German people come from. That's the place. And the, there's also a fantastic collection of Dürer. So anyway, that's uh, Shifting Stones. Another me uh, sense of memory is not the past, it's the future, because we have to see that memory moves into the future. It is not only held in the past. Now, this is a private house for a couple in Connecticut. And I thought a lot about, you know, what is memory today? How, how do you uh, take a couple's memory and project it into their, their love, into the future? Now, it's a building standing on a, you know, it's, it's chocolate brown. It's stainless steel with a particular color. 
Uh, by the way, not a single wall here is at right angle. Everywhere, and it's standing on, the, on this landscape that picks up the light. Sometimes the building is light blue, sometimes it's green, sometimes it's black. It's hard to really show exactly what it looks like because depending on the angle in which you are. Now the building, this uh, monoca construction, which means that there are no columns in the building, is folded into the inside of the building. You can see that the structure comes into the actual inside of the building and the building itself is solid wood. It's oak. It's not oak veneer. It's not thin. It's really like a log cabin. And I always say it's like my clients. They are very hard on the outside. They are both art collectors, very sharp and hard, but very soft on the inside. So again, you know, there's a kitchen, you know, the great cooks and so on. Uh, so they asked me actually to design everything. You know, I wind up designing really my first sort of total Gesamtkunstwerk because, you know, everything, you know, the lighting, the, the table, you know, the fireplace, and even the bathroom, you know, the, the shower and the gadgets, you know, that, you know, that the Victorians invented, invented should be really redesigned to promote a different domestic sense of a couple today into the future. And the house is very sustainable because it doesn't have large picture windows, you know, even though it's a beautiful, it has porches with very, you know, moved uh, openings that move in terms of the seasons and the sun. Uh, so they are not gigantic glass windows. It's a sustainable building and actually a very dramatic one, uh, day or night. Uh, and I always say I only, only made one mistake in the building because uh, this couple gave us a key to the house for a weekend and said, well, you can stay for a weekend. We're not there. And we stayed. And then my wife has never said something other than, why don't we have a house like this? <laughs> so, Another building that deals with memory is my project in Kurdistan, in Erbil. Uh, I'm working for many years. It's not so easy to build a building in a war zone. You know, ISIS was there, wars, recent betrayal by America of the Kurds. Uh, it's in Erbil, in one of the most ancient cities. Uh, 8,000 years of inhabited history, this mound. And we're right in front of the building. The, the site has been cleared but the construction hasn't begun. I think it will start this year. So there is the building made of local stone. It really tells the story of the Kurdish people because a lot of the Kurdish people themselves don't have a place to understand the long history of the Kurds. And it's a history that is kind of inspiring. They are surrounded not by neighbors that are friendly, but difficult neighbors, and they have to survive with their own idea of their own future. So you have the, the building in this local stone. You have the Anfal, you know, the, the Saddam Hussein's attempt to kill genocide against the Kurds. He killed 80,000. And I went to the villages to talk to, you know, wives and kids, survivors. And it was not so different from what I know from my own background. And then up there is another part of the building that rises towards the citadel on top of Erbil. And of course, it's, it's a museum of culture. It's a museum of the heritage of the Kurds. It has interesting presentations, uh, uh, not only of history, but also of the art, which is very rich in Kurdistan, uh, interesting things. And of course, it has the, the Anfal, the zone which you have to traverse that has the waters of the rivers of time and a dramatic space, a social place for people. And then you emerge into this upper level on this diagonal uh, sort of uh, space uh, with the, the classic, you know, the, the, the flame of freedom is not only in the Statue of Liberty, it's the Kurdish symbol uh, of, of the Kurds. So it's, it's a building that I think standing in front of the citadel uh, will be, I think, a really a, a interesting building that has the memory, the sense of memory of the Kurds, but also the future of the Kurds. The Kurds are not about to just give up and, and blend in. They are a people who have uh, indefatigable sense of their own freedom. And that's an inspiring project, uh, interesting uh, project to work on in terms of memory. Now the overture, I, I call it the overture because if you look at this picture by Vermeer, you probably know it, you know, you see it's called the harpsichord player in the museum. But we know very well without having to be students of art history or philosophers that what Vermeer is showing is nothing to do with the harpsichord player. Zero. There's a harpsichord player, there's a harpsichord, but we know that the painting is about something else. And that's really what I think architecture also. You know, we have a program, but architecture is always about something else. Here's a residential project. 
This is housing in a small city state, uh, Singapore, uh, which called really for rather low rise housing. There were, there were towers about half the size. But I convinced the government that uh, in an era where we should condense the footprint of buildings, make them more compact and go high because we can't afford to eat up the land horizontally, it's smarter to create a building that goes high. But not only high, you may not notice it very well, but the buildings are doubly curved, which means that every floor in the building is in a different position. So it's not a tower that is just built on top, but just slightly off, which means that everyone has a very unique, and believe me, it's a very unique sense when no one is exactly below you and no one is exactly on top of you. You're just in a slightly different position. So there it is, it's, a, it's on Keppel Bay, old industrial area of Singapore, and it's a very dense project. Uh, it's almost Baroque in its, in its sense of how to create an idea. And that's what I said. Uh, 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 you know, there, think about this. There are two words. There's the word building and the word architecture. In art, there is only one word, art. Everything is art. You take it or leave it. It's art. I call it art. You call it not art. But in architecture, we have building and architecture, which means you can build all the buildings in the world, but there's no architecture. And you can have a piece of architecture, which is in a drawing, which has never been built, but it is architecture. So there it is, Singapore, uh, these doubly sense uh, curved towers with the gardens in between, the amenities, the large public spaces on the boardwalk, uh, the amenities uh, for the public, not just for the residents, and the sense of sort of a community uh, and the sense of saving the little green space that you can still save. And I, I think Singapore is a city state, it's a small place, but I think every place with the attack on, on the environment, with what's happening with you know, climate change, has to th rethink how to build buildings and particularly residential buildings. Most people pay a lot of attention to museums, to public buildings, but I think the most important thing is really where people live. That's the iconic center of life. That's what is memorable, and that's where the idea or the overture really lives. So you can see the amenity levels connecting the towers. And by the way, Ridley Scott, the filmmaker, has just recently made a film about the future here, but it's already several years old. Uh, so again, you see it sort of going into the sky. And then I was asked to do another project, very close, very different regulations. Uh, but again, what I decided is to put the low buildings at the, at the marina, the, rather than the high buildings, and make sure that everybody can have a view of the bay, which is beautiful. And you can see it here from the, this is called the corals, uh, uh, towards the reflections, the other project. Again, a kind of change of the idea of how one can create an idea for communities that are dense, uh, but very, very good to live in. And I have a proof of it, because the Reflections Project, the first one, was, you know, many famous architects work in Singapore, was the most profitable project ever built in Singapore. I'm very proud of it. No, because developers have to make money. So that's important. And uh, in this project, the head of the planning uh, agency, as I was there, looking at the buildings, how did they turn out, called her husband and said, let's sell our villa and let's buy a unit in this place. It's a good recommendation. Uh, the unobserved unicorn, you know, it's about sight. Uh, the Chinese apparently have a theory that everywhere there is the, the unicorn, the white unicorn is there. But most people don't see it because of the white horses. So the unicorn is blending to the white horses and they don't see the unicorn with a the horn. They just see the white horse. I think it's a pretty wise, very ancient thought that something unusual is hiding in the most usual space of camouflage. So here it is, uh, my contemporary Jewish museum in San Francisco based on Chai. Uh, it's America, but everybody knows the Chaim. And based on the Pardes in, in the sense uh, of how the Talmudic idea of using the Pardes as acronym for the ways of interpreting a text. And the building, of course, is a text. Now, I have to tell you, and this is also about beauty, two famous architects gave up the project. They, they, they did it and they said, you know, we can't do it, it's, it's, it's nonsense. You can't build anything meaningful here. It's too difficult because part of the site is under the Four Seasons Hotel. Actually, it's using the kind of the basement of the Four Seasons. Part of it is uh, behind 
that city beautiful facade of the former electrical station of San Francisco. Part of it is on the connector behind the church. So what fun is this to build a building if it doesn't have, but I thought this is good. This is a kind of a Jewish project because it's really in the margins. You know, it's not in the obvious center, it's kind of around. So you can see, you can see the yud, you can see the chet, the part of the chet, because the, the rest of it is, is kind of inside of the building. And by the way, I think you know that the Hebrew letters are not letters, they are mystical entities. They are not just graphic uh, representations. And that's how I approach the building. So there it is, uh, the, the old city beautiful, with, you know, with the electrical station, but beautiful facade, the yud behind the church, and the, the, the pardes wall, which, which is illuminated here, you can see it, with the industrial, so I, I restored the industrial sense of this power station, because interesting, this fueled the development of San Francisco, and it's contemporary Jewish museum because it's about the values that Jews brought, which are ecumenical values. It's not, by the way, I don't know whether you know it, 90% of Jewish people in San Francisco get intermarried. The intermarriage rate is, is hugely high. Those people who get intermarry, which is most of them, don't identify with the synagogue, not at all. I, they don't identify it with Israel, not at all. So the idea of this museum was, how do you bring people who have culturally a sense of belonging, but they have really nowhere to go, bring them to, to a place that has art, that has education, that can sort of develop a sense of identity, which is not really the identity that we knew you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And it is interesting that it attracts a lot of people, of course, not only Jews, but many people who do have really have kind of nowhere to go. And it's an interesting building. The Yud, you know, this Yud form, by the way, it's standing on a point. Hard, by the way, to design a building that stands on a point because buildings you require a large, you know, rectangle or something. But, you know, the Yud, it's a mystical letter because, you know, everything we know from Jerusalem to the Jew to Israel stands on a Yud. You know, it's, 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 it's a letter that has a point, and it's a pointed letter, and I love that part. And, and again, the proportions, the light, the numerological mystery of numbers is part of the building, and you can use the pardes, you know, for the literal, analogical, uh, symbolic, even the secret associations that you find in the building, and it is, again, a building that has brought life to this sector of San Francisco. It's a beautiful city. Uh, with a sense of, 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 of a purpose. And that's also part of beauty. Beauty is not just creating aesthetic things. Ah, another project which allowed, uh, is, is, is a, my project in France. I was lucky to win three competitions, Paris, Toulouse, Nice. Uh, this is in Toulouse. Toulouse is a low city, beautiful city, pink. Uh, and the regulations called for a really low, fat, big building. Uh, the developer and I decided there's no reason to do that. We should do a tower. We should do something that is special, but not any tower. It's a railway station. The tower really has a park, really. It's a multi-program you know, uh, uh, program tower. It's a residential, hotel, uh, offices, the retail at the bottom. It has a park, two and a half thousand square meters of park space, not really surface of trees, but really into the tower. It's a very dramatic tower. Uh, I had to, there was a meeting organized for all the heritage uh, experts in France and Paris. Will such a tower destroy a historical city? That was the question. There were 40 experts from all over France. They came, uh, I presented the project, they thought and thought, and within about half an hour we got the call that they approved the project. So cities do move ahead, and I think it's gonna be quite an amazing place right next to the Canal du Midi, uh, protected by UNESCO. It's a beautiful place, and of course it's, it's a tower that is dramatically redefining. Think about it. Toulouse with a, a speed a bullet train is uh, less than three hours from Paris. And Toulouse is not a nostalgic city of, you know, uh, of uh, Rabelais or something. It's a city that has the space industry. They produce the, not only the airplanes, but, but the satellites. So it's a city that, you know, also needs to move forward. And I think, luckily, you know, when the building is built, uh, you'll be able to see the Pyrenees. You'll be able to be, and that's a public space actually on top. Uh, it's not private, and I thought that was important that people can, can come there and it's not just uh, for the lucky people who live there. Uh, the labyrinth, you know, the labyrinth is uh, my thought about uh, method. You know, what method do you use to create something? 
Uh, we know that uh, the oldest story of architecture in, in Greece is the labyrinth built by Daedalus. Daedalus was an architect. And Daedalus also, you know, he created the labyrinth, but he also create, created the first airplane to get out of the labyrinth, to fly high, except that his son, Icarus, as you remember, flew too close to the sun and he fell to his death because the wings melted, the wax wings. So it's a beautiful story. And uh, I recently designed a museum, a very unusual museum, which is a museum of military history in Germany. People ask me, like, why are you designing? You know, you're designing the Jewish museum. Why would you? Well, it's very important. It's the largest museum in Germany, you can imagine. Military history museum is big in Germany, and it's in Dresden. And that's a painting of a canaletto of Dresden. It was considered the most beautiful city in the north. It was called the Venice of the North. You know, the Semper Opera, the amazing churches, the amazing galleries, the museums. It, that's the city of beauty. And then you might not even know this photograph. What the city looked like after the Allied bombings in 1945 it was completely erased from the map. And yeah, what do you do today? So my project is the following. There is the, the U-shaped uh, armory. And I inserted a, I inserted a, a, a wedge, a, a wedge into it, which is self-similar to the three bombs that fell in the vicinity to start the bombings of the Allies which took place on between 13th and 15th of February 1945. So you're, through the wedge, you're inserted into the point of destruction of the city, but also to the view of the city. So here it is. This is the armory, uh, which was built already in 19th century. Very soon after it became the military museum of Saxony, uh, of the Kaiser, of the King, uh, of, of, of Hitler. It was a museum of the Soviets. Uh, Museum of East Germany, and then when the unifi unification began, the question was, what do we do with this building? You know, how do we kind of go on with mil and And I was lucky to, to be able to sort of do this project, which, which deals with not just the past, but the future. Look, this is a, a cross-section of the plan. You can see that, it, that the triangulation of that bombing is kind of asymmetrical to the form and it interrupts the building, which is chronologically organized from the 12th century Teutonic Knights uh, in, in Germany, all the way to Afghanistan, German soldiers in Afghanistan and NATO. And it inter it's interrupted between 1914 and 1945, exactly those militaristic years which brought so much misery and horror and, and devastated so much of the world. So that's kind of, you're looking at the cuts, you're looking at the three-dimensional sense and the incorporation of all the elements, including the famous staircase and so on. Uh, of course, I, I had to restore. It was very badly treated by the East German government. Uh, it was kind of really badly done. So I restored the armory to its previous sort of sense of what it was. And of course, Napoleonic Wars and all that stuff is amazing here. By the way, the lions uh, of Judah, the elephants of Hannibal, who would have ever connected those animals uh, employed in war to biological warfare, to Laika, the first dog in space, to the way you know the carrier pigeons was used in World War I. To what extent humanity has employed the natural, so-called natural world into the destiny of violence? And the building is very interesting. It has many different exhibitions, uh, emblematic objects like this alouette, you know, again, reference to, to nature. And by the way, in these empty spaces of the museum, uh, a question is posed to the public. The, questions are pop the following questions are posed. Why do people follow authoritarian leaders? Why do they agree to march when they are told to march? Why do they agree to kill on order? Now, no answers are given. No answers can be given. But the questions can be posed. And uh, of course, you see the toys. You have a kind of a sense of what falls from the sky and what is really part of the experience of devastation in in this museum vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, the landscape. Now, when you emerge to the very top of the building, you're at the, what they call the Dresden Blick, the view of Dresden. And you see here on the, on the ground, really the fragments of cities bombed from Dresden. Vielitschka in Poland, Rotterdam in Holland, uh, many cities, uh, uh, Coventry in England, bombed from Dresden. So you see the devastation. And then what's really interesting, you leave the museum on the outside. You, you go very high up, you're suspended high up on an oblique plane. Uh, it's open, there's wind 
going through it. You're literally suspended in the wind, and you have a fantastic views of the Frauenkirche, the restored, so sort of baroque uh, Dresden city. And you, you float in this space where you're simultaneously in the cage of the bombing, and you're also released, and you're in front of the museum. And of course, that's important, that I wanted to put people in front of the facade of the old building. Because, of course, in a democracy, it's not the generals behind the walls who make the decisions. It's the civic society which instructs what happens. And so you can see the, 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 the juxtaposition, the strong cut, uh, and the strong sense of difference of questions about the military. By the way, it's like uh, West Point. This is where military soldiers come to learn about German military history, which is vast. And it's a building that has brought so many people uh, who would have known how many weddings take place of military families? In fact, the Minister of Defense at the time when I did of Germany, Mr. Mezier, de Mezier, showed me a painting of his grandfather as one of the generals, you know, in the 19th century. So, again, it's a building that kind of opens the question of war. And, of course, it's not a peace museum, but I came as close as possible to speaking about peace in a military museum. Chess game. Well, you know, when it comes to beauty, when it comes to architecture, most people forget the money and the client. But you know that that's the most important thing to build a building. If you don't have a client and you don't have money, as Walter Benjamin said, you know, people talk about the four elements, you know, air, fire, water, earth, but they forget the fifth fundamental element, which is money. So how are we to design? Now, that's a question that I did not ask first. You know, many architects before me Ask the question, how does money and power, politics, relate to building? And I had this experience because my first building, as I told you. By the way, it was not called the Jewish Museum when I started. That's what I tried to change. When I started, I was working the, the co co competition in 1989 was calling for a Berlin Museum with what they called the Jüdische Abteilung, with a Jewish department. So the Department of History, Department of Industry, Department of uh, you know, uh, Art, and a Jüdische Abteilung. Now, I know enough German to know that Jüdische Abteilung was coined by Eichmann to murder Jews. So I said, you know, you can't do a Jüdische Abteilung. Now, this is a competition of 200 architects, including from Israel and the United States. Everyone did the same thing. They designed a big Berlin museum with a small Abteilung called the Jewish I said, no, it's not possible. Design a museum that is based on something completely different. It's not based at all on the, on the department. It's based on the Jewish contribution to Germany and to Berlin. So, of course, I used, you know, this is a, uh, this is a uh, Schiele uh, drawing of uh, Schoenberg. As I was a musician, one of my para-architectural ideas was I'd like to complete an incomplete opera. You know, Schoenberg wrote in Berlin an opera called Moses and Aaron. I don't know whether you've ever heard it. It's seldom staged, but it's one of the masterpieces of 20th century. And he abandoned it. You know, there's two acts. The third one is missing. He left Berlin. He was exiled, kicked out. And Arnold Schoenberg became Aaron Schoenberg, came to California. So I thought, you know, what would, how could I complete this opera? And, you know, I created a void in the building, an acoustical space. And I thought you could complete it by the echoes of the footsteps of the visitors across a void. If you listen to it, Moses, you know, because Moses calls uh, to God for an answer, you know, calls on to God in the, in the end of Act Two, and there is a silence. And I thought, you know, an answer can be given in the footsteps across the void. Echo. I used Walter Benjamin's uh, Einbahnstrasse, his one-way street, to organize the museum. How do you open a one-way street? And so on. Uh, there it is, the Baroque building. The, the, the museum, and probably what's most unusual is that the two buildings don't have a bridge. Now, every one of the architects in the competition, and it was published, so I know it, provided a bridge, but I thought that was not possible. There's no bridge between Berlin before and Berlin after these events. Absolutely not. I created the bridge really in the underground, because at the height of the Enlightenment, think about it, Hegel, Kierkegaard, Lessing, Moses Mendelssohn, the amount of bigotry and hatred of Jews was apparent. Think about it. What the philosophers, who are still sort of deemed worthy of study, what did they say about the Jews? So I thought, let's put them in the darkness, that bridge is in the darkness. And by the way, 
is correct also archaeologically because 1933, Jewish cemetery stones began to be used for the paving of the subway system in Berlin. So you, yeah, it's an unusual entrance. It's an unusual set of roads which uh, winds up in the what I call the Holocaust Tower. Again, a space that is completely not a museum space. There's nothing to show in it. It's not air conditioned in the summer. It's not heated in the winter. It's just kind of a space with a sliver of light. And I have to tell you, for many years I worked on this project because it took a long time to design, you know, to build this politically, not architecturally. Uh, I had it dark, complete darkness, Holocaust. You can say nothing. It's just complete dark. But then I read one of the survivors uh, in a book. Uh, she was quoted in Brooklyn. Somebody said, so how did you, she went to Stutthof. Stutthof she was deported to Stutthof. And she said, well, I was locked in the cars and I saw a line of light. And I, he said, she said, I don't remember where the line came from. Was it the crack in the car? Or was I looking through and seeing a white line, a plume of airplane smoke? But whatever it was, I held to that line. And I survived. She believes because she held on to that line. So I did finally do that and uh, the Garden of Exile. By the way, symbolic garden about Israel. So it's seven times seven, a perfect square, 49 columns. Center one, Earth of Israel. The 48 with the Earth of Berlin, 1948, creation of the State of Israel. It's in a tilted plane, so you feel very, very dizzy if you stand there because the whole environment is seen in a way like from a tipping boat or tipping plane. And of course, then there's the main stair, that's the third axis of the project, which you will notice doesn't lead to a door. It's probably the only museum where the main circulation doesn't lead to a collective atrium or space of redemption. Because I don't think there's such a space of redemption after you've seen the history of Druze in, in Germany. There is no such redeeming space. It's just a small turn to the left and you then wander through the exhibits, which, you know, these windows are very systematic. They are cuts that represent a, a, a matrix of addresses that connected Jews and Germans around the site into thousands, but I couldn't go into hundreds of thousands, but it's there. And then there is that void running in the center. It's a disconnected void across the bridges. That's where you hear, if you stop for a minute, you'll hear the answer given to God, by God, to Schoenberg's query of Moses. What, what is the meaning of the event? You hear those echoes of the footsteps. And again, it's something that uh, it continues to live. It's, it's, it's a building that has definitely had a big impact on, on how people see uh, the history of Germany in Germany, how Germans see it. Jews don't need to see it, Jews know it. Uh, expression. I love this uh, word because it's not the expression of the architect, it's the expression of the building. Now, where would, it's a dirty word in architecture, correct? You can have expression in painting, expression in literature, expression in theater or cinema, poetry, but in architecture we are in a neutral space. Build everything like this, so it looks neutral, so you take no position, which is the biggest position in the world. Uh, so, yeah, expression, well, think about an espresso cup. It's the expression of coffee. It's literally not the diluted coffee, it's the expressed coffee. So yes, that's actually architecture, and that's my notion of beauty, is expression. Uh, in Nice, under construction, is this project. It's, a very key project. It's next to the central station, uh, uh, railway station of Nice, a beautiful city. Between, you, you can see the railway lines and you can see the big highway that was built in the 60s, like in many cities. What do you do? How do you connect the streets? How do you create, a, a, again, a program that is interesting uh, from the highway? Again, it has shops, it has cultural facilities, it has offices, hotels. It's a cross-section of a city. And how do you create a building that really kind of does the thing, links across the devastations of the infrastructure, brings people together to the pedestrian level, and gives a sense of unifying the south and north of this beautiful city. Again, uh, it's an urban project, it's, it's, uh, it's an infrastructure project, but it's also, by the way, it was a competition. All the architects in the competition, mostly French, created neoclassic buildings with nice arches of the 19th century. They thought it was nice, but the governor and the mayor of the province thought, no, Nice is not an old-fashioned city. It's the, one of the largest cities in France. It needs to be sort of move ahead, not stay where it was. So how lucky for me. And then, of course, expression here. 
is probably the, the, the most difficult project I ever worked on because it's already 18 years. Uh, my first sketch, one of my first sketches, what to do there. Again, a master planner, you know, who is my client? I don't have a single client. Who is the client of this project? People think there's somebody who is, no. Families of the victims in the thousands. Believe me, there are 3,000 or so people who perished, but the families are in the tens of thousands. Uncles, aunts, sons, brothers, mothers, thousands. They are no number one. Number two, who owns the site and leases the site to private developers and their own architects is the Port Authority of New York, which has 7,000 engineers and architects. Think about it. An organization that has 7,000 engineers and architects. That's who owns it. It's a public authority. Who is the uh, Port Authority run by? Run by two very powerful governors, the governor of New York and governor of New Jersey. There are two very powerful governors who control the Port Authority. The streets of New York are not the governor's purview. They are owned by the mayor of New York, controls the streets. And what's under the streets? The path trains, separate authority. Subways, MTA, separate authority. So it's, it's a complex, <coughs> complex project. And of course, there's the president of the United States. There's money from the federal government for the infrastructure. So you can see that in order to build such a project, you need to bring a consensus to parties which are very, very far removed from each other. Now, this is a picture we saw when the, when, when the attack happened. Was everything was devastated except this wall, which, by the way, it's a, it's a dam. It's not a wall. On the left side, you've got Hudson River. You've got the pressure of the waters of the ocean. And here you have the bedrock of New York. And I decided very early on that I should keep this wall. It's very hard to keep such a wall because it's a foundation. Foundations are visible only when they are destroyed, never when they are actually in, 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 in use because you have to put loads on top of them. But I was really uh, happy to be able to work with the engineers who liked my idea in the Port Authority, who were able to preserve the, the, this witness uh, to the amazing structure of New York and create a place that, you know, was interesting. When Pope Francis came to New York to give his ecumenical address a few years ago, he didn't choose Times Square or uh, you know, Central Park or St. Patrick's Cathedral to give his ecumenical message. He chose the wall, to give the message of the wall in front of the wall, which I thought was very moving. And of course, the footprints with the names carved around them, the waterfalls was also part of the master plan to bring, uh, you know, a sense of, of, of acoustical, you know, it's a musical idea. In no center of a city has a waterfall that is so large that it can cope with the noise of city streets, so you can have a private sense of experience. And by the way, since I started working on this project, more than 350, almost half a million people have moved to Lower Manhattan. Believe me, when I started, most people thought Lower Manhattan will never come back to life. It'll be always, you know, everybody had moved out, but it has come back to life. And it's thriving that 35 million visitors a year to the site alone, and it's not finished. You know, it's, it's, it's still in construction, there are many elements. Now the Performing Arts Center is being built, tower number two, hopefully soon. But I would say it's about 85% finished. So, you know, architecture is a marathon. It's not something you do and you're finished. Some projects, you know, the Jewish Museum gave me good training because a single building should not last for 11 years, which it did. But this one is already beat it, beaten it by many years. And of course, it was inspired by the Statue of Liberty and how I disposed the buildings and created the largest possible space. Think about it. It's 16 acres. That's the site. Eight acres of public space. That's what I fought for. You know, my mother and father, you know, were working people in factories of New York. And I said to myself, you know, if you're not going to be lucky enough to work in those offices, what do the regular New Yorkers get at Ground Zero? They are there on the way to work, subways, streets. They're running to feed their families. Give them a sense of place that has an, a panorama, a breadth of sense, and also uses that, that memory to create something which is interesting. So that's really, yeah, what it is. And the last project, this is a project I'm working with this man who is Richard Leakey. The man who single-handedly, I think with his parents, created anthropology. I mean, the origins of, of people, where do they come from? How did we evolve? from monkeys. What, what, what was it? And here it is, uh, Anthropologist Richard Leakey with Homo habilis. So he asked me to work with him on a project of human origins in Ngaran, in Kenya, in Nairobi. 
the Turkana tools, you know, I went to Turkana, that's where we all come from actually, it's amazing, we all come from Africa, strange. Uh, and we were black, not so long ago, we were all black, how strange. Uh, but I saw these tools uh, which, which were shown to me by some scholars uh, from Oxford who are watching, working on this project, and I thought a lot, how did human beings develop, you know, given the big animals that are around, and the elephants and the lions, it was some genius, I have to tell you. I don't know how, but the greatest achievement was somebody who thought, so holding a stone, and I held that stone in my hand, holding the stone and another stone in this hand to visualize a sharp point, to hit this stone with another stone to get a sharp point which you could then dig in, you know, eat, cover, you know, cut flesh, cut, cut things. Yeah, be able to, so really humanity is dependent on that genius who really created that Turkana tool. There is my project. And, and, and so it is based really on those tools at a very high scale. Uh, it's, the, it's the stone ax with, with its sliver space and then building really moving underground. And really, it's really a, a space for pilgrimage. It's really not just a museum, because of course the exhibits will be very technologically advanced, but it's really a place uh, really where you stand on the Rift Valley you can almost see really down to Jordan Valley. You know, it's, it's one continuous space. It's, it really is. And, and it's a dramatic, dramatic uh, uh, museum, I think. Difficult to realize, of course, but I think with Richard Leakey, who has got a kind of spirit that, you know, is indefatigable. He's got no legs. Both legs were blown off in a terrorist attempt against him, but he has not given up. So I have a little film here uh, with Richard Leakey, where Richard Leakey is speaking about it. And yet, it's never been told in a celebratory way. If we can get across the message that we're all one species, we all have a common ancestor, we certainly all have a common destiny, then the issue of bigotry, color, racism, just simply pales into insignificance against the real story of what we have to do to survive. The last big extinction, which happened as a result of an asteroid colliding with the Earth somewhere near the Gulf of Mexico. And the drastic change in climate killed off many species that simply couldn't adapt quick enough to survive. What's frightening is that we are behaving like an asteroid. We're in direct collision with the systems of life, polluting the ocean, overpopulating the planet knocking out species that are fundamental to our own survival. And yet, we have the technology, I believe we have the brains, that if we bring together the two and we realize that the damage to the planet today is not an asteroid, but is us, we can change the way we do things. I think a wow experience on the human story is what we need. And so I visualize an architectural design that would match the Sydney Opera House. We're going to build in Garran on the edge of the Rift Valley. The paleontological record in the sites in the Rift Valley is phenomenal. And I think there's something very symbolic about telling the story where the story unfolded. 
Imagine going into a gallery and, and you have people seated and your guide says, please be quiet because I'm going to introduce you to some of your ancestors. And then quite suddenly, a Zinjanthropus racing into the room and then stops and looks back with a look of horror and fear. And suddenly from another side of the room come in a band of homo habilis wielding a club. And you hear screams and yells. The story comes alive. You're there, you're in it. They can actually walk behind you and you're terrified. We want people to get the experience. Yes, I saw it. That's what you want. There's nothing like it in the world. The building that Daniel Liebskin has designed is based on the shape and form of a primitive stone axe, a hand axe. It'll stand 80 meters tall, a place where your first reaction is, wow. We're a species that now has the capacity to understand through science, to respond through technology. We have to understand the concept of cause and effect. The future of life on planet Earth will depend on how we treat the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Some questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, Daniel Lipsky. Thank you for a brilliant, brilliant thank lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, combining, combining culture, literature, philosophy, music, uh, arts, and exposing your brilliant work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, if there is one question or two, uh, Mr. Libiskin is prepared to respond. Have you any? Okay, thank you very much for your lecture, Mr. Lipskin. Lipskin. Okay, my question is, um, we s one could tell your designs are very distinct. That is a lip skin design. I wonder to what extent they are ne um, negotiable. Your architecture is negotiable with the client. It's a good question. You know, you couldn't build these projects if clients did not <coughs> approve of them, if they didn't want them. Uh, you couldn't convince somebody that it's a project that they should build. But uh, luckily for me, uh, I've had very interesting people who sometimes came with a very different idea. For example, I'll give you an example. When I built a, I don't know whether you know it, uh, a large museum in Denver, Colorado, the Denver Art Museum. It's a very large, very radical proposal. The man who really was behind the project, uh, Mr. Hamilton, was an oil man, very conservative, ultra conservative, I would say, with a huge collection, one of the largest impressionist paintings in the world. And he said to me, Mr. Libeskin, I'd like you to design something in marble with a pediment that has kind of like a classical you know, Greek temple. I have to say, you know, it's very hard for me to design <laughs> such a thing. But slowly, uh, Mr. Hamilton became a fan of a sharply pointed titanium building <laughs> that had no you know, and he fell in love with the new technology, with a sense of discovery, adventure, because I think that's really the spirit of architecture, and it's not new. You know, when you read uh, uh, Chantelou's uh, diary of the visit of Bernini to the King of France, you know, Bernini won the competition for the Louvre. They had, you know, a fantastic project. And he went to France with, you know, all the workmen and everything to build the project. But slowly, he was undermined by the French architects. And how, how was he undermined? The French architects, who saw that incredible elevation of the Louvre, and if you don't know it, take a look at it, said to the king, whispered, when you go to meet Bernini, ask him for the plans. You know, he's given you a beautiful image, ask him for the plans. When the king, Louis XIV, asked him for the plans, Bernini said, I am not a servant of the king. I'm the architect. Ask the French architects for the plans. So there has always been a conflict between authority and creativity. And now he didn't succeed. He didn't finally build the project. The French architects, Perrault and others, built the project. But 
you know, it's an adventure. And, and if you're lucky, you're, you know, you need, you need some luck. Uh, and you need a Nina, who's my partner. She's here. <laughs> no, true. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, I would never do this alone. If I didn't have a partner who's much smarter than I am, I would never be able to build any of these buildings. That's the key. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.